Good morning, grandkids. Well, today we have another book to read, and Nanigo's just going to be hanging out. I don't know what he's going to be doing. But today, we're going to read The Hope of the Red Room. This is kind of an interesting book because I don't think it makes all that much sense at the end, but we shall read it and then maybe discuss the end of it. Oh, who is that by? Turiel Nereth? I don't know who that is. The Hope of the Red Wing. One of the few magical arts the Sigics of Art Arteum have kept to themselves away from the common spells and schools of the Mages' Guild is the gift of divination. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, omens and prophecies abound in Tamriel, some of substance, others of pure folly, and still others so ambiguous as to be unverifiable. There are still other prophecies kept secret from the prophecies of Dojzad in Elsewhere and the Nerberin Ner and Morrowind to the Elder Scrolls themselves. I really hate all these strange names. The Nord nobility have a tradition of having omens read for their children. In general, these readings are of the obscure variety. One of many acquaintances told me that her parents were told, for example, that their daughter would have her life rescued by a snake, and so gave her the name Serpentkin in a special ceremony. And this young lady, lady Aria Valcourt Serpentkin, was indeed saved by a snake many years later when an assassin, creeping up on her, stepped on a Danswerven viper. And I guess it killed him, poisoned him. Occasionally, omens seem to be almost purposely misleading, as if Boethia had crafted them as traps. I recall one particularly. Many, many years ago, a male child was born into the house rhetoric. It was a very difficult birth, and the mother was delirious and near death by the time it was over. She chanted just as her son came into the world and just as she passed from it. And this is what she chanted. Fortune has smiled this day, not frowned. My child will be mighty in mind and in arm. He shall bring hope to the house of rhetoric. Neither spell nor blade shall hurt the man, nor illness nor poison cause any harm. His blood shall never drop on the ground. The boy named Andus was indeed extraordinary. He never was ill and never suffered so much as a scratch all through his childhood. He was also quite intelligent and strong, which combined with his invulnerability, caused many to call him, after his mother's omen, the hope of the Redoran. Of course, anyone who is called the hope of the Redoran will eventually develop some taint of impertinence, and it wasn't long before he had enemies. His worst enemy was his cousin, Athen who had borne much abuse at the hands of Andus. Primary among the grudges was that Athan had been sent to Rehide to complete his education at Andus' insistence. When Athan returned from Hammerfell, it was because of the death of his father, who had also been a counselor of the house. Athan was old enough to take his seat in the council, but Andus claimed the seat as well, saying that his cousin 
had been gone too long from Morrowind and didn't understand politics as he did. The majority of the house agreed with Andis, wanting to see the hope of Redoran rise quickly. But Athan exercised his right to come combat his cousin for the seat. No one thought he had any chance of winning, of course. But the battle was scheduled to commence the following morning. And as Horde and dined and drank with the counselors that night, confident that his place in the house was secured and the hopeful new dawn of House Redoran was rising. Athan retired to his castle with his friends, Andis's enemies, and his servants that he had brought from Hammerfell. Athan and his friends were discussing the duel morosely when one of his old teachers, a warrior called Sardi, came into the hall. She had grown quite proud of her student over the years in Hammerfell, proud enough to accompany him across the empire to his family's lands. I don't think I'd have ever wanted a teacher of mine to accompany me wherever I moved. And she wanted to know why they had so little confidence in his odds in the battle. They explained to her Andis's uncommon blessings and the nature of his mother's omen. If he can't be harmed by disease, poison, magicka, and his blood can never be spilled, what hope have I of ever besting him? cried Athan. Have you remembered nothing that I taught you? replied Sardi. Is there no weapon that you can think of that will slay without blood? Are swords and spears and arrows the only items in your arsenal? Athan quickly realized the weapon Sardi was speaking of, but it seemed absurd, not only absurd, but pathetic and primitive. Still, it was the only hope he had. All that night, Shardy trained him in the art and techniques, showing him the various swings and stances that her people had developed in Albion Gora. Counterattacks, feints, blocks imported from Yaguda, the classic one and two-handed grips for the most ancient weapon in history. Now here, when I read this through the first time, I stopped and was trying to figure out what weapon they was talking about. And it took me a long time to think I had figured it out, but I hadn't. Can you? The cousins faced one another the next morning and never have two combatants looked so unevenly matched. Andis's entrance brought a great cheer, for not only was he much beloved as the hope of Redoran, but as his victory was a foregone conclusion, most wanted to be in good standing with him. His shining mail blade drew admiration and awe. By contrast, Athan drew a gasp of surprise and only a smattering of polite, polite applause. He appeared costumed and armed like a barbarian. As Shardy had suggested, Athan allowed Andis to attack first. The hope of the veteran was eager to finish the battle, take the power he deserved quickly. His blade pushed by Andis's mighty arm, slashed across Athan's chest, but shallowly, and before it could be counterswung, Athan knocked it back with his own weapon. When Athan attacked and wounded Andis, the hope of the veteran was so surprised by being hurt for the first time in his life, he dropped his sword. The less said about the end of the battle, the better. Suffice it to say, 
the Athen welding a simple club, battered Andes to death without spilling a drop of blood. Athan took his father's seat as counselor, and it was then said that the hope in the omen referred to Athan, not Andes. After all, had Andes not tried to take the counselor's seat away from his cousin Athan, being not very ambitious, might have never tried to get it. It can certainly be argued that way, I suppose. But the thing is, if all of that prophecy was supposed to have referred to Andes, how could one particular thing, the hope of rhetoric, be taken out of it and applied to Athen? So the whole prophecy wasn't correct. And as far as battering him to death with a club and not spilling a drop of blood, that just doesn't sound feasible to me. I've read lots and lots of murder mystery books. And if somebody just picks up a, like a candlestick and smack somebody in the head with it and they fall down dead. It's usually because it's cracked their skull and there's blood leaking out on the floor. So I don't know how he could have been battered to death with a club and there not be any blood. So I think that's kind of a strange ending, but it's cool. I'm glad the right guy won this counselor's seat still sounds kind of fishy to me. <laughs> but I hope you liked it. Um, I don't know what... Uh, oh, there he is. I started to say, I don't know what Amigo's been doing all this time. I guess he was just listening. I hope you liked it, Amigo. He just doesn't know what to do with himself. He needs to be out fighting, not staying in here with me. But I do take him out when I go out searching for books, when I've bought everything there is in the stores. And we have a good time, but that's not what this is about. This is just about reading you stories. So I hope you enjoyed that one, The House of Rhetoric. And I wanted to say this. Uh, someone asked me why I didn't put the names of the books on the title of the video. Well, I thought that if I didn't, then it would be a surprise every time you opened up the video and saw what book we was gonna read. And I thought that'd be kind of fun. But this person said, sometimes I want to go back and, and hear again a particular book that was read, and I don't know where to go to find it because it's not in the title of the video. And I guess they have a point. So I'm going to put the title in this video and I'm going to go back through the past videos and edit them all and put the title of the book in the title of the video so that you can search better. Okay, so that's going to be it for now, grandkids. I hope you'll come and let me read you a story next time. So bye-bye, grandkids.